I challenge you to a duel. Is this the only argument I need? I don't want to talk to you no more, you... You got a lot of nerve. Soon you will know what it's like to be defeated. Stop defending him, Sean! All right, let's go. Hey, sleepers, and welcome to the Sleeper Wire Great Debate Show. I am your host, Professor Chris, and with me once again, I have Dirty Jobs Mike on the Great Debate. What's going on, man? What is happening, man? How's it going today? You know what? Things are pretty good, man. Things are pretty good. I'm hoping that Denver's defense uh, can pull out some points for me tonight. We're recording this during the Monday night show. Or the Monday night game, not the Monday night show. And uh, hoping that they can put up some points. I need 1.3 from Denver to win this week. Oh, they they ought to be able to get you that, man. It's the Denver defense. They're already kind of getting in Mahomes' grill a little bit. So I'm thinking they'll continue that, hopefully. I Man, I have a lot invested in this Denver offense doing well tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I don't really have any pieces in the offense. I guess I got one league with Philip Lindsay going and another one with Demarius Thomas, but those ones I've either already lost or I've got the win locked up. But definitely just 1.3 points. That's all I need from the defense. By the time you guys are listening to this tomorrow, you will already know what happened. But let's go ahead and jump into the show. This show is called The Great Debate because that's exactly what it is. It's a debate. It's not an argument. We get two and a half minutes to argue for our player. 90 seconds for rebuttals, and then we have final thoughts, and that's it. There is no loser. There's no winner. It's just unbiased, objective, stats-based arguments for and against two players. We take those gut feelings, and we throw them out the window, and we dig into some numbers. And we're doing tight ends this week. We've done running backs. We've done wide receivers. But we did have two major tight ends go down this week. And at such a weak position, we thought it was important to, you know, talk about some of these tight ends on waivers. We lost... Tyler Eifert and OJ Howard. So this week we have Tyler Croft versus Cameron Bray. I've got Cameron Bray. Mike has Tyler Croft and Mike go ahead and kick it off with Tyler Croft. Two and a half minutes on the clock. Okay. What can I say about Tyler Croft that it's Tyler Eifert part two. He's great. He's fast. He's almost just as big of a presence on that team. If you look at what he's done so far, in his career, he's got 67 catches for 661 yards and eight touchdowns with 42 of those catches and 404 of those yards and seven of those touchdowns coming from last year when Eifert went down the last time. Eifert's always been that guy that goes down, although this time I feel like it was kind of a fluke injury. Man, that looked like it hurt the poor guy. I really feel bad for him. But I feel like Tyler Croft is the guy that can just slide right in there and take his place with zero issues. I think this team loves throwing to the tight end. I think they love throwing to the tight end in the red zone. And Andy Dalton hasn't been playing terrible football lately. If you look at what he's been doing, he's been getting the touchdowns for all these guys. I mean, A.J. Green's been lighting it up. You got Mixon. He's coming back any day now. But in the meantime, you got Giovanni Bernard, who's out there doing a very good job as well. And he'll continue to do well coming out of that backfield in the passing game. So you've got A.J. Green. He's going to be just perfect out there. He's going to be sucking in a lot of that uh, influence on the on the receiving core. And then on the other side, you've got Tyler Boyd, who's just ripping it up as well. And he's a huge presence. So you're going to have all these wide open sh- shots at, at Tyler Croft, he's going to have nobody on him. You're going to see this, and the, they're going to say it's a defensive breakdown, but it's not even really a defensive breakdown as much as it's going to be. There's really no one else. You've got Mixon who can well establish that running game, which it seems like Cincinnati's a run first game. And for me, with a run first offense, if you've got the tight end playing on that team, it usually works out towards good production. So when you look at Tyler Croft and his production as as a comparison to the rest of the tight ends in the league, which is abysmal right now, if you don't have one of the three, which also Rob Gronkowski went out this week, but it looks like he'll be back hopefully by Thursday. But he'll be a completely serviceable guy. He's not going to get you legendary numbers or anything like that. But if you need yards and you need touchdowns, this is your guy. And he's going to be able to get it done for you every time. Mm. 
All right, so he's got opportunity, no doubt. If Andy Dalton continues his current pace, he's going to be valuable. But Tyler Croft has had plenty of opportunities the last couple seasons behind Tyler Eifert. I mean, we all know that Eifert is this super injury-prone tight end, and once again, that's proven to be true. Although this one was kind of a fluke injury, nothing to do with his back or anything like that that's been nagging him. This was a horrible broken ankle to watch. Tyler Croft started all 16 games last season, and he finished, as you said, 42 catches for 404 yards and 7 touchdowns. In comparison, Bray only started five games last season, technically, and finished with 48 catches for 591 yards, and that was splitting time with Howard and having Ryan Fitzpatrick. Tyler Croft started 11 games in 2016 and had 10 catches for 92 yards. Starting 11 games, only 10 catches and 92 yards. He started six games back in 2015, 11 catches for 129 yards. 129 yards. This guy hasn't been able to get a big leg up on the other Bengals backup tight end, CJ Uzoma. Both guys were getting targets the last two seasons, and both have been somewhat involved so far this season behind Eifert. In fact, Uzoma has seven catches for 74 yards and a touchdown this season, while Tyler Croft only has four catches for 36 yards and no touchdowns. Now, I do believe that Tyler Croft is the better tight end in Cincinnati, but the numbers so far don't lie, and the numbers are exactly what we're looking at here in the Great Debate. <laughs> All right, so moving over to Cameron Bray, I am really excited to talk about this guy. This guy is an underrated tight end, and he's an especially underrated tight end when it comes to fantasy football. Now, don't get me wrong. It's been the O.J. Howard show so far this season, but guess what? Not only is Howard out two to four weeks with a sprained MCL, but Ryan Fitzpatrick has once again been benched, and Jameis Winston is now the starter. And that is great news for Cameron Bray, the tight end who signed a six-year $40.8 million contract this offseason with $18 million guaranteed. Over the last two seasons, 2016 and 2017, Cameron Bray is second among tight ends in touchdowns with 14, just behind Jimmy Graham. This is a guy who scores touchdowns very frequently for a tight end. He had 57 catches for 666 yards, and or 660 yards, I'm sorry, and eight touchdowns in 2016, 48 for 591 and six last season. Last year, Bray had five games with one catch, right? Five completely dud games, only one reception. However, four of those games were consecutive, back to back to back to back from weeks 9 through 12. And he also had no receiving touchdowns in that span. Guess who the quarterback was for those games? It was Ryan Fitzpatrick, who likes to air it out and who targeted O.J. Howard more those four weeks like he did at the beginning of this uh, season. Bray averaged about four catches and 46.2 yards per game with Jameis Winston, which doesn't sound like much, but that's good for a tight end these days, and he's got the added red zone chemistry with Winston. He was fifth out of all tight ends in red zone targets last season, and fourth back in 2016. Let's face it, Bray gets targets in the red zone. Ryan Fitzpatrick didn't even use Bray for four straight games last season, and he still finished fifth out of all tight ends in red zone targets. Like I said, that chemistry between Cameron Bray and Jameis Winston is real. Speaking of those red zone targets, though, I said that he has 14 touchdowns over 2016 and 2017. He's got two more this season, both inside the red zone. That means that Cameron Bray, over the last two and a quarter seasons, has 16 total touchdowns, and 15 of those 16 have come in the red zone. 15 of them. That's more red zone touchdowns than any other tight end over the last two and a quarter seasons, including Jimmy Graham. Outside of Ertz, Kelsey Gronk, and maybe some other guys, arguably, yards and receptions are hard to come by at the tight end position for your fantasy team. Touchdowns are what makes tight ends valuable, and Cameron Bray has certainly had a ton of scoring opportunities and will continue to do so. Okay, so I'm a big fan of Bray. I really do actually enjoy this guy and like watching him play football. The thing that I've seen between him and O.J. Howard that can't pass the eye test is it always seems like O.J. Howard is – the better bat, the better tight end. Anyways, he's a bigger guy, not by much. I mean, he's only about an inch taller and about six pounds heavier, but he seems to be a lot faster and he seems to have more of a dominating presence on the football field. Seems like when he's on the field, they're able to actually move the ball better. And last year, just involved in the few games that he was, he had 26 catches for 432 yards and six touchdowns. Now that's eaten into a lot of production out of a guy who last year also, like Chris said, had 57 for 660 and 8, which is amazing considering that he only played in a few games or was actually only serviceable in a few games. Like, 
with Fitzpatrick out there, it's anybody's game. He doesn't have any love for the tight end. I think he throws it to O.J. Howard, though, only because of that simple dynamic that this guy has in his arsenal. The fact that he's able to run a clean route, get out there fast, and be able to catch the football, run it down. He's he's hard to stop, and he's definitely hard to tackle in the open field. And these are things that I don't really feel like Bray has. With Bray, it seems like he gets those red zone targets, but he doesn't seem to do you very well between the 20s. I think you'll see him do well over the next two to four weeks when OJ is out. But after that, I just don't think that he's going to be that uh, much used. Even though Winston loves him, I think he'll end up loving him. And real quick, today's show is sponsored by PristineAuction.com. It's a site that has hundreds of new auctions every single day. Everything on the site is signed. It's JSA certified. It's all 100% authentic. It is free to join. It's free to bid. And you only pay when you win the auction. Visit pristineauction.com today and let them know that you heard about them from Sleeperwire. That's P-R-I-S-T-I-N-E auction.com. All right, let's take it back to Tyler Croft here. Mike, give me your final thoughts. Okay, so I said it before. I really like Bray. I like Tyler Croft. I think like with the situation that you're looking at right now, as far as the devastating tight end field, I think either one of these guys added onto your team can actually make a very significant difference. So the only reason I feel like Tyler Croft is a better bat or a better tight end for the situation is that he seems to be able to get involved with the offense a lot more and he gets more of the 20 to 20 work. And there's only about three guys to pass to on that whole entire team. And one of those guys is AJ Green, who's always going to have double coverage. And then you got Tyler Boyd, who will also probably need an additional cover man. So I feel like Tyler Croft is going to be the guy that gets open more often. Taking it back to Cameron Bright here. Bright finished as the tight end seven back in 2016 with Jameis Winston. I'm talking on PPR leagues, tight end seven. And he was a tight end 10 last year when he had four games with Fitzpatrick, barely targeting him. And he was competing with OJ Howard with no OJ Howard for a few weeks and Jameis Winston back. Cameron Bright has once again thrust himself back up into the top 10 tight end discussion. This is a guy I am going to be spending a lot of fab on, and I recommend that other people do this as well. If you lost Eifert or if you lost Howard or if you lost Evan Ingram for a few weeks or if you lost Delaney Walker, this week we hardly ever have two tight ends who can be very fantasy relevant for you come up on waivers, and that's happening this week. So both of these guys, great options. If you can't get one, try to get the other one. All right, that's going to wrap it up for this week's Great Debate. Please follow us on Twitter at Sleeperwire Show. I'm on there at Prof underscore Chris SW. Mike is on there at DirtyJobs21. Check out Sleeperwire.com. You can also find our rankings on there every single Wednesday. You can submit a question to the Sleeperwire crew. You can follow us on Sleeper at Professor Chris and at Dirty Jobs. And then on the Fantasy Life app at Professor Chris and Dirty Jobs there as well. Thanks for listening, guys. We'll catch you next week.